Good evening, everyone. Afternoon, evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Unless you're on the West Coast, Dinner in which time. case, welcome home from school. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Lesson Picks Live. We are here again. It's Lori and I, founders of Lesson Picks. Uh, I'm Bill Binko. It's Lori Binko. And we have another fabulous OT this week. Uh, we have Julie Marzano, who we've known for a number of years, um, and she'll give her a little background. But we're going to talk all things OT again. This is the second of at least four sessions That's right. uh, this month, and probably four, because I haven't gotten the fifth one worked out yet. That's okay. Right. It's four weeks in April. There's four so. weeks in April. There's four, there's four, two, there's four Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Yep. We could do one on the last Tuesday. We don't know yet. But um, we've had uh, Alyssa Warren, and we mm -hmm. have Julie, and then we have Judy Schoonover and Debbie Schwinn. Yep. And these are awesome OTs. You're going to love every one of them, and they're all very different. They're going to talk about very different stuff. So, Julie, welcome. How are you? I'm great. And you, It's finally you, warm in Philadelphia. Yeah. It's it's that way, right? No more rain. The birds are chirping. It's lovely. Gotcha. Nice. Very cool. So we just got back. We're in Florida. We just got back from Indianapolis. We went to see the eclipse. Could it you see cool. it in Philly? I did. I did. I, we had the little glasses and everything. It was pretty we, cool. This was neat. It went right over Indianapolis. So we flew there with my friend Chris, you know, Chris Young from AT Makers. Yes. Um, so I went to his house because he really wanted to fly a drone and watch it. We did. We did everything he wanted. And, but it was so, I think it was massively impressive. I was surprised. Yeah. yeah. It was, it went dark. It went like hour after sunset dark. And in, in every direction you looked, there was a sunset. It was really weird. Oh, wow. Well, it was like a glow. Glow. It was so cool. You could see the stars came out. The birds were, like, it did everything they said it was going to do. If you're actually in the center, it does that. It was super <laughs> wow. cool. That's so, so cool. It was so cool. Yeah. So we have, uh, so we are on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. If you're watching us, uh, say hi in the, in the chat. We can see you. We'll put your name, your stuff up here. Um, and if you don't catch us, if you're catching us later, don't worry, we will get notified if you ask questions. So feel free to ask them in the chat, even if it's after the uh, video. Perfect. Okay. But we're going to get started. Uh, Julie, you are in Delaware County uh, near Philly. Yes. And uh, you run a practice with your sister, Emily, who's no longer Marzano. No, it's no. Marzano McCarthy gang. McCarthy, there you go. And we've <laughs> happens to be my identical twin sister. So yeah, it's a little confusing when they're around. It can but, be, but uh, kind of funny. Our our oldest two daughters are Emily and Julie, and so it's really easy when I see you both. But if you're separate, I have I I don't know. Yeah. but I'm like Julie yeah. Emily. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. So um, let's get started with, with what kind of an OT are you? I mean, we we kind of learned that they're <laughs> they're all over the, the place are. on what they can do, but what, what kind of an OT are you? We are unique beings. Uh, I, I spent 17 years, um, in the public school at an approved, like, at, um, a, a school that was self-contained that worked, worked with students with complex needs. So if a home district couldn't serve their student, they would bring them in house to our public school. And it, I also worked in preschool for 17 years. And now I am in a suburb of Philadelphia at an approved private school for about 120 students with um, huh. complex needs. And okay. my, say my niche is more the um, multiple, multiple disability complex communication needs um, right. would really be my focus. And I really like the older students too. Uh, like those are the tougher ones. 15, yeah. 16, 18, 19, 20, 21. Those, those are, those are my humans. Those are my people that I gotcha. really am passionate about. So uh, we present, um, Emily and I wrote a curriculum, five motor bootcamp. That's the name of our company. Uh, it doesn't, exactly represent everything that we represent. Yeah, we all evolve, right? We, yes, we, we do. We certainly have. We, we, we do things very differently than we did years ago. Yes. Um, and, and yeah, we, we met you when you were doing Fine Motor, motor Boot Camp. And, yes, uh, the ASHA very conference. Much at, at, the, at the ASHA conference, exactly. You walked up and you introduced yourself and then brought us over and I was like $36 a year. I'm sold. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I, and that was years ago, and, and it's still thirty six dollars a year. Shocking, yeah. So and shocking that I was outgoing and extroverted. No way. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> ringleader among uh, among vendors, but um, but yeah. So it was really neat to see, and then and, and you and I, um, you and I actually, um, worked out worked a little bit together on the AT Maker side. Um, yes, I have. I brought it up. I have it up. I can share. Uh, I think. Can share. I think I can share. 
let's see. Um, yeah, you, so we we worked on these dice rollers. Yes. And then I believe did I did I ever ship you these? Or we talked about it at the same time, the, the dice with I the, think we uh, talked about it at the same time. Rock, paper, lizard, spock. Rock, yes. paper, scissors, lizard, spock. Or you could just do rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. You okay. added the big bang version. Yes. But yes, we, I remember that's all coming back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so we we have we have um we have worked uh considerably together on a number of things over the years yeah. in the AT um you know custom AT hard to find kind of stuff, lots of switch adapted stuff, et cetera. Yes. And uh, we, we, we have a, we have a uh, Kelly Fawner is joining us. So she's, she's oh, from yes. Philly as well. And um, hi, Kelly. So good to say hi, Kelly. And so, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about today rather than, you know, the, the path to get here. So as an OT here, you want to walk through what, you, what you do today, kind of give us a, and then so, how you use lesson picks, obviously, but that can be secondary. So last week you talked about um, how our professional models are moving to this very integrated practice. And I feel like when you have students with complex needs, that's kind of been a practice we've always been doing, mm -hmm. um, kind of writing those student-based goals on their strengths versus coming up with isolated goals. Because we know that 30-minute sessions of pulled outside the classroom uh, one day a week is really not going to foster a rich learning environment back in the classroom. So we take the perspective where we write integrated goals as a group for every student. Um, we have pre-IEP meetings and we work with these students with significant needs that I say sometimes I feel like their home districts are like, we can't do this. And it's our it's it's a true privilege for us to get to work in improved private school and work with these students um, that their home districts are like, you know what, this is too challenging. So it's a true honor to get these students and be able to programming for them in meaningful ways. And I feel like our roles as an OT is really looking at participation when it comes to students in a school environment. And what does that look like? I mean, this is a very big complex word. And I think as OTs, we are really, really good at thinking outside the box and coming up with creative ways and not being um, focused on what they can't do, but looking at what an individual can do and looking that as a strength and increasing participation with whatever God-given abilities and gifts that they have. So right. I'm going to shift over. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background about what participation is and our role as OTs and how we can support meaningful and active participation within a classroom for students that might have low arousal levels, minimal um, physical abilities, but they have abilities. It's our, so it's our job to find the abilities. It's not what they can't do, it's what they can do and how can we foster a meaningful educational experience for these individuals based on participation and autonomy. So I'm going to switch to my slide. So I'm going to hold on. We walk, we practice this. I'm going to share I screen. You, you unshare. I got, it. I, I got it. I'm in it. I'm not in Zoom. So this is new for me. <laughs> it's StreamYard. Yes. It, it works great. It really does work well. Here we and a little work background. Work. Um, at everything I do, I I typically create um picture supports on lesson picks and i put them in the sharing center so if there's anything that you see today and you're like oh my gosh that i want to use that tomorrow or um my name is julie marzano and it's fmbc in the sharing center so yeah. you can always hop over there and just download whatever you need um if you're anxious to try an activity tomorrow fmbc fine, fine motor, motor boot camp, boot camp. fine cool. motor boot camp yeah. so I, I will i'll whoops. show them where that is here so fmbc look it's it's Julie Marzano, FMBC, in the Let's sharing center with all this stuff. Look at all this stuff she made. And her logo is French fries? Is it? I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> I'm French fries. I'm looking over at it. <laughs> I love it. We log back in. Um, so when you when you share your screen, I will put it up. It is not oh, shared I, yet. I thought I did share it. You can't see it? You can't see it. Hit mm -hmm. present. Share screen. Entire screen. Choose your screen. Entire. Oh, I've never hit the share button. There we go. There we go. All right. I mean, hey, yeah. look at that. Okay. So that. our focus today will be our students with complex needs, physical, communication, 
cognitive complex needs. They're the students that require a maximal support within instructional tasks. They, to, they need a strong communication partner and teacher to be able to be supportive. It's about 2% of IEPs. So if you think of um, those high incident learning disabilities and IEPs would be like your kids that need reading support. We're talking about that very um, low incident population of about 2% of IEPs. Right. Those students that are typically not just in a self-contained classroom, but a specialized school. Yeah. So, and, so is it like SMA, something systemic, something that it's going to be a massive challenge, um, not not an isolated issue on their IEP. It's yes, yes, physical needs. Um, yep. We'll need more uh, personal care support. And typically they might be one or two kids in a school. So that's typically why they're um, approved to go to a different school uh, that could meet their needs. And often these individuals are viewed at a participation level. We use unique learning systems um, in our classrooms as our, okay. <laughs> what <Sorry>. was that? <laughs> Nothing. She's picking well, on me because I was kicking something out of the way. Go ahead. Oh, um, <laughs> unique learning system. You for our curriculum, curriculum, right? Yeah. It's a grade band extension of what yep. students are doing in regular ed schools. So yep. we highly adapted. It's already very highly adapted and we adapted even more. And you're going to learn ways that you can adapt these um, activities in the curriculum using lesson picks and ways that we support our students. Okay. And these are the students where meaningful and uh, participation can be extremely challenging to figure out. And these are your students that are often done to and done for, right? Everything yep. kind of is just done for them and to yep. them without sometimes us just pausing to say, hmm, how can I pause for a second and give just an ounce of autonomy in this situation? So what's participation? It's involvement in life situations. And that's going to look different for every single human being. Um, it's the interaction of a person in the environment. And it's the person's ability to interact despite what their limitations might be. It's a human right. It is active and not passive. It's meaningful. And sometimes, let me jump on meaningful. Sometimes people will be like, oh, this unit in ULS isn't a, you know, they're not going to understand it. We don't know what people are going to be interested in and that something might pique their interest. Like we just did a um, unit, one of their news to use was um, Women's History Month. And the kids mm -hmm. were really interested in that. And who are we to say what's not and is appropriate for certain students? It's our responsibility to give them information and see what really makes them tick. Right. It allows for choice making, interactions with communication partners and people in their environment and their environment, autonomy, and we measure it through engagement. OK, so not every lesson is going to be a home run. Some are doozies. But you know what? If they have a low arousal during this um, activity or this last lesson or this unit on colonial times, we know it's just not an area of interest of theirs. So maybe we put that little note in their IEP or on their data sheets, sheet and say, you know what, they didn't really dig the colonial times, but they really liked when we did animal home unit. I think you could find that in um, any classroom. Actually. Yes. Kids aren't really digging this colonial unit. <laughs> yes. And then you'll have kids that do. And what I found right. even in my own household is that, and I don't want to say there's gender divides here, but boys tend to like nonfiction. Okay. And mm -hmm. I am finding that a lot of um, my older students are really into the history lessons and the nonfiction types mm -hmm. of material. And sometimes you find something fascinating like Egypt and you yes. think, oh, I don't know if they're going to grasp this concept of, you know, this, this other place and particularly another time in another place. Mm -hmm. And to see like a high level of arousal over a topic like Egypt has blown my mind in the past. I yes, they might pick their head up more. Right? Yeah. You're, yeah that's their engagement. It. You know, then you can measure and say, oh my gosh, they're actually really enjoying that. But if we never afford them the opportunity to right. learn about different things in the world, we're doing everyone a disservice. Right. right? Not just the students in the classrooms, but all of us who are working because it becomes monotonous. And boring. Right. none of us are excited about education. Right. That's exactly. I love this picture. I love by the this. Way. I love this slide. I'm, I'm stealing your slide. <laughs> so I worked with a speech pathologist, one of the most brilliant women. She has since retired. I mean, I still meet up with her, and she, we would write IEP goals. And she says, 
would say, I don't think this passes the frozen turkey test. Right. Participation. Does, and you have to ask yourself when you're writing a goal or doing an activity, does this pass the frozen turkey test? <laughs> if a frozen turkey can do it, it's not active participation. A frozen turkey can tolerate a prone stander, right? Yep. A frozen turkey can accept hand over hand. That is not <laughs> <Yeah. participation. laughs> right, really, right? <laughs> I love it. So yeah. when you're, re and listen, I still I make these mistakes. I'm like 25 years into this career and I still make these mistakes. And I'm like, I'll leave a classroom and be like, what on earth just happened in there? Like, uh, but you know, you, you live and you learn. And if you catch yourself, you know, I'm going to do this better the next time I do right. it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. That's great. <laughs> So when we think of educational services back, you know, in the 70s, 80s, dare I say even the 90s, it was very much based on personal care, keeping people clean, people keeping fed, keeping, keeping people fed and just basic contentment. But you know what? It's so much more than that. Our, our students are capable of so much more. So education has moved far beyond basic care needs and just keeping people happy, right? because in this world, we are meant to be participators and not spectators. So when you're doing an activity or you're, and again, I I make these mistakes every week. So, but you have to pause and right. self-reflect and say, right. okay, how could I have done this unit better? So you wanna make sure that if you're doing a lesson that your students are participating and not spectating. And when we think of educational goals, it's how can we increase participation in daily life and how can we allow individuals to exercise control over themselves, their environment, and other people? They right. are so dependent on other people to be able to, for them to know that they can tell someone how they want something done to them and for them is so powerful. So just to, to pause for a second. So one of one of my favorite stories in L'Oreal back me up. Will so, I? Yeah, you will. I think I will. I will. You you absolutely will. So <laughs> when when she was first starting out with some AEC in her classroom, Vicki Hadix, a speech path from Boston, but now from Memphis, um, she asked her what to put on these these, you know, what what is the first thing I can get a kid to do? And the first thing she said was tickle me. She recommended buttons. Two buttons. Said tickle me and go away. Go away. Yeah. Go away. Right. And this was just from a motiv motivation for to understand you can impact your your world you can you can these words that you're hearing actually can get people to do stuff yes. and you trained all your paras this is a little guy and when he first at first pushed the button that said go away i had to go away and everybody in the room had to be okay with me just Walking away. away, and then we could move on. Then you went it. back and told them why you had to come back. Well, I, eventually we moved to where I can't go away right now. Right, but you, you responded know, but every time. Every time. Every time, right? So, so we that just wanted awesome. that cause and effect, and he loved the go away button. Yeah, oh. that's power. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and you said something really important: responsiveness. And our responsiveness to communicative intent for these individuals is the most important thing we can do for them. Yeah. Whether it's a sound they make, a movement they make, they're being heard. Right. 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 We're doing things for a certain reason to gain our attention, to say, come here. Or if you go up to them and they turn their head away, you're saying, you want me to go away? I'll be happy to go away. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you can't, obviously yes. you can't leave them alone. You can't like, you, yeah. you still have to do your job, but you can respond to it and then come back and say, okay, I can't leave. I understand what you said, but right now we have to do whatever. Um, Sometimes I couldn't leave. I'd hide behind a piece of furniture, though, and he just thought that was hysterical. So I'm yeah. like, I'm out. And then I'd have to, like, hide yeah. but still be in the room. <laughs> They're being heard without yes. saying a word. Right. Right. Yep. Um so I, I, the responsiveness part, you're absolutely right. You know, that come and go. You were saying, he was saying, come here, tickle me, go away. Two core words. There, there's a reason they're the first 40 words that kids learn. Right. Because right. they're so powerful. Yep. So when we think about participation, communication is the foundation of participation for whether you're a neurotypical human or a student or an individual with very complex needs. And when we think of participation and what you just did piggybacked into this slide perfectly, um, we accept any and all forms and modes of communication. And we honor those modes of communication 
as active participation. And when we anticipate that a person is com can communicate, it will resolve. It will result in active participation. So if we believe, believe this person's doing this for this reason, that means they're actively participating in what's happening. So where do we start with um, active participation for most complex students? We talked about communication. There are so many more forms of communication beyond verbal speech. 80% of what we do is non-speaking communication. It's eye contact, it's facial expressions, vocalizations, gestures, body language, emotional responses, change in your pitch and intonation when you're speaking. And why do we communicate? The communication matrix that we use for our students with complex communication needs to refuse, to obtain social interactions and seek information. So I talked about like these forms and modes of communication and what we really focus on, and this is a focus of unique learning systems has something called your active participation guidelines. And when I read them 15 years ago, it really shifted my perspective of you do not need, I was perseverating on switches and high-end communication devices, and they can't communicate unless they have, you know, a Toby or a PRC device. And what I realized is that I was missing so much. Um, active communication responses or modes, We um, there's three that we look at, and it's a visual focus. Do they look at, glance at, make some sort of eye contact with either the material, the picture, or the partner? That's an active communication response. Then, oh, Emily just walked in. Hello, Emily. Hi. Um, the SLP. So <laughs> then you have your motor active uh, communication responses. And again, these are based off of what the gifts that individual has. So a motor action might be a movement of the head, of the body, or the limb um, that show a direct correlation to that activity or material. And everyone's thinking, oh, this student's so disengaged, their head's always down. And I'm like, um, they're probably, if you you have a background in CVI and understand that a lot of individuals are so overwhelmed by visual stimuli, they may drop their head to block everything out and they're, they're listening. But people think it's disengagement because neurotypical people hold their head up when they feel engaged. So you really have to be in tuned with your students. And you have to really look at your students and say, what is their active communication response? If they're non-speaking. Is it visual focus? Is it that motor action? Or it could be a direct vocalization. Make any vocalization that's directed towards the activity, materials, or the person. When we have, um, you know, a newborn, for instance, my newborn, I knew if the cry was if they needed their diaper change, if they were hungry, if they were scared, or they just wanted me to hold them. But for some reason, as, stu as individuals get older and they might not develop um, typical language, we kind of forget that these vocalizations might be geared towards something, right? They're making a vocalization and then sometimes we're like, well, it's a behavior. They're always making this loud sound and it's getting louder and louder. I'm like, well, they're not being heard and maybe they're trying to gain someone's attention. So really look at some of these movements, the way they move their head, the way they move their eyes, the way they might vocalize, and say, hey, this might be their active communication response. Right. Maybe they're loving it. Right. Yes. Maybe, maybe they're getting loud because they're having a ball. You just can't tell. Right. Yes. And then some of my students, I will walk up to them and you, something works differently for them every day. I, I feel like some days I'm really good at, um, say, sewing. And then some days I'm horrible at sewing. I'll go to a student and say, OK, I'm listening to you and watching you. Show me what is working for you today. Is it your head? It's your hands? Is it your eyes or it's your voice? I will honor anything you show me. Right. <laughs> right? right? Um, because you do have those students that even moving their arm or blinking their eyes takes a tremendous amount of motor planning and effort on their part. And I want them to know that I'm listening. We're all listening and we will respond to your intent. So how do you use these types of things for meaningful terms? participation and how the heck does lesson picks tie into all this <laughs> it does it does it does uh, yes and we're gonna just jump into partner assisted scanning and what that is it's an alternative to pointing it's an alternative to pointing because our students do not have the physical ability to be able to isolate a finger and point or take a hand and touch things so what we call it is partner assisted scanning and much of what we do for meaningful and active participation for our students is very partner assisted. 
You have to have a strong communication partner and you have to take your time and be in tune to the students. So uh, it's the way that a communication partner lists and scans through options of choices. We try to keep a consistent structure that either we present language or choices. Um, formal partner assisted scanning might be mo consistent. That would be like your pod system where you're presenting right. the same language in the same way. Informal might be like, okay, do you wanna wear the red shirt, the flower shirt or the green shirt today? That's informal. It's gonna right. be listed differently all the time. And we do a lot of formal and informal partner assisted scanning in our environment, right? Cause we keep things fresh, right. but we also wanna keep things consistent so that maybe after eight years, they learn that these words are gonna always be presented in this pattern. And I'm gonna wait and listen until I hear what I want. When we partner assist scan and we give choices, um, it's never closed ended. There should always be a way out. And I learned this from Linda Burkhardt at Closing the Gap. I was doing partner assisted scanning and she's like, there should always be a way out. It should never be closed ended. When someone is um, giving you the specials at a um, restaurant and you're listening auditorily and you're like, okay, you're nodding, like I hear it, I hear it. And then you might stop and pause and say, hey, that sounded like something I might like. You're not communicating anything. You're using those active communication modes and responses with as a neurotypical person when someone's giving you the, the special menu at a restaurant. Right. And again, it can be auditory, visual, or both. And you always want at least three options. Because if it's not three options, it's either this or that. 50-50. Right. So when I use lesson picks um, and different ways out with partner assisted learning, um, scanning, when you offer choices, and I'll get into more detail of what is this partner assisted scanning for anyone who has no idea what I'm talking about. When we offer choices that have other options, we're going to offer a word like something different. So if there's markers, I know I have more than three colors of markers, but I only want to pre present a little bit at a time to not overwhelm this individual. Do you want a red marker? green, blue, something different. Those are your choices. And you're going to be um, operational in your presentation of their choices. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be like, red? You want red? You want red? Because you're putting your own bias on that individual. You want to act like a device. Red, green, blue, something different. And that scanning rate is going to be different for every single person. Some of my students need 15 seconds in between their choices. And you know what? They spend their whole life waiting for an opportunity to participate. It's our responsibility to give them the time that they need to be able to make a choice to meaningfully participate. Sorry, that's my soapbox. No, you no, I, I agree. <laughs> I, do have, I do have a question for you. Yes. Um, from your soapbox up there. Yeah. So we have we have um, seen issues on, on some of this around our, our practice here and things. I do have a question. Yeah. How do you consciously how do you consciously make sure you're not falling into the trap of adding your bias to their choices and their I mean choices is one thing or the other but when you're doing more of a, a commenting or things like that you're still doing a partner assisted scanning but you've got to make sure that that they're the authors that they're that it's their communication how do you not bring your own in there you know what? You just have to remind yourself. Um, now, partner assisted scanning is very partner perceived, right? Right. Right. You are perceiving intent. We are perceiving communicative intent. And even if we don't think in our hearts and minds that that's what they wanted, we are responding to what they did and saying, I saw you take a deep breath when I said green. Right. You're telling me with that deep breath, you want green. Right. Because even if it didn't seem like an authentic choice, if you respond to that action or motor plan or whatever they're doing, that vocalization, visual focus, motor movement, thousands of repetitions, it's going to click and they're going to be like, oh my gosh, someone is listening to me and taking the time to honor what I'm doing as a choice. Right. But it's, it's, it's hard to stay um, unbiased. And I find things like I get really excited um, and over animated and loud. And sometimes we'll be like, boo. Um, you. Doesn't sound like you at all. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's tough. And 
sometimes, you know, I'll say a reminder in there and I work in classrooms because I found that modeling in classrooms is the best way for people to see what our students are capable of. Mm -hmm. I, I, I try never to go in a classroom and say, you need to do this, this and this. I will modify a ULS lesson and say, all right, I'm going to do this unit. Um, so I'm going to push into the classroom and our lessons when I push in might take two or three hours. And why? We, there's no need for us to rush through. As I said, they spend their whole life waiting. Like it's our time to honor the time they need to make it meaningful and authentic communication. It's okay if you don't get through a lesson in a day. Sometimes it takes two or three days. Right. Emily right. wants to answer a question. Yes, Emily. Just answer Bill's question. Come over here then. Okay. She's Come not on the camera. There's room. I can even change your title. I can add Emily. Okay. Yes. It's Emily. Hi. Hi I'm Emily. not on screen because I'm not all dot up like Julie. I, I just was at track practice. <laughs> um, so your question, Bill, I think you're also looking to shape what a child can do into their communication. So maybe that big breath that that student took, maybe that really wasn't their communication response, but it was a different something they did with their body. And you acknowledge that and you say, oh, it looks like you took a deep breath. That means that you want this. Just like we shape regular speech, you know, we would say, or verbal speech, we would say, oh, baba. I think they want their bottle. So we shape that baba. Oh, it looks like you're trying to say bottle. You want bottle. Um, and also the other part of that is really knowing your kids, knowing their bodies, knowing their personalities, really knowing their interests and their likes, which I think Julie will get into when she um, talks about the journaling. Are you getting to that? We, we talked a little, we touched a little bit on that. Yeah. So you get to kind of learn through the journaling, these kids, their preferences, their likes, their dislikes, in hopes of keeping that all for post-transition. Mm -hmm. And Emily said, like, take that deep breath and we respond. And I, I hear a lot like, well, they don't have cause and effect. Well, I think we're all born with cause and effect. Like Karen, we, Kangas Karen Kangas is like, we're all born with cause and effect. And so when they take, they take that deep breath and we do, and they do that and we respond to that, that's cause and effect, right? right. They're going to eventually learn that this is a means to an end. Wow. Someone's listening to me, even though I'm not verbally communicating. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, sorry, sorry I derailed you. That's okay. I'm really good at getting derailed. So when offering choices that you have other options like markers, red, green, blue, if they pick their head up or if they make a sound like, uh, or if they drop their head, you tell the, you, you state what you see and you say, this is what you said. You picked your head up. You dropped your head. You vocalized on blue. You want to, you want me to color with the blue marker. Okay. So when there's, but if they didn't want any of these and they pick something different, you would switch the pictures out and then go maybe purple, yellow, and orange. Right. When you're offering choices that don't have other options, like equipment, like sometimes, okay, this student's in the standard. So the standard is not an option. Like it could be, do you want to be in the hammock swing, body sock, trampoline, none of these. If they pick none of these with their communication response, I'm going to be like, okay, you just want to vibe in your wheelchair. I get it. You don't want to do any of these. That's fine. Right. And again, when you partner a scan, you're being operational. The timing in between each choice is very subjective per student, but you want to at least go through choices three times. If they don't make a choice or show an active communication response by the third round through, you say, you're not ready um, or you're not interested. I'm going to go ask someone else. So you let them know that, you know what? You don't have to answer if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. When testing a student. So if you're and this is like, oh, I was like, oh, my God, I'm so mad that I just never instinctually thought of this when I watch Linda Burkhart. Um, you're ask, asking a comprehension question. You should always have an I don't know. It is OK to not know the answer. So if you're asking a student, do you want to write the story about a dog, ball, tree? I don't know. Or if you're asking a comprehension question, the story was about a dog, ball, tree. I don't know. They have a way out. So when she talks about having a way out with partner assisted scanning and giving choices, just make sure you do it. And it can look different. Every time I present, someone has a better way to um, or another way, not a better way, just another way to think of that way out listed um, choices. So some of the things that we do in the classroom, a lot of our students might use a step-by-step, -step, those programmable devices where you press the button and you can like count one, two, three. 
we'll let the students pick what voice they want record. Do you want a ghosty voice? Or do you want a witchy voice? Or do you want a robot voice or a singing voice? So if we're going to be their voice, why not let them have the opportunity to choose what they want that voice to sound like? Right. You could be a ham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then self-selected routines. Like we all have that like time in the day where you're like, Ugh! um, you know, I don't have enough time to set up like this amazing activity, but I have like 15 minutes. So we'll pull this out and say, okay, who wants to decide this self-selected activity that we do? Do we want a moment to move our bodies, read, do a quick math game, play a game, listen to music, explore a different part of the classroom? So instead of just us deciding, well, why don't we just go outside for a walk? Or why don't we just, you know, put a song on? We're letting the students have an ounce of autonomy about what that time fill for that, that time void is going to be filled with by offering them the choices of what they'd like. Maybe they want to read a book. And right. we do that in that partner-assisted scanning way. We do this every day in my one classroom. Um, sometimes we, you know, that low arousal level, because I do have older students. Everybody gets an equipment. where Everybody's in different kind of equipment. But, you know, sometimes they're kind of like not ready their bodies aren't in that learning regulation state. And these aren't kids, that, um, students that you can just, you know, pick up and put in a different position. It requires a mechanical lift. And if we had to do that, we would just be moving people all day. Right. So we were like, okay, well, how can we come up with a way that they can, before we do to and for them, they can decide how they want their wheelchair to be moved. So we might say, okay, do you want to spin your wheel? I see you're having um, a hard time staying awake in class. Uh, do you want to spin your wheelchair? Do you want to shake in your wheelchair? Do you want us to tilt your um, wheelchair back and forth? Do you want to move back and forth? Do you want to bounce in your chair or do you want to turn side to side? Or if someone feels uncomfortable in their chair, some say, I, I see you're upset. I see you trying to move your body in your chair. You're telling me you want something different. Um, do you want to try to spin in your chair, shake? Do you want your chair tilted? And I'll go through the partner assisted scanning just so they have some autonomy before we just walk up and tilt a wheelchair. Cause we're assuming that this individual needs to shift in their body weight, uh, or we're just deciding what someone likes. And what's interesting, like if we'll, we'll just do this, like in our morning meeting or like, Oh, let's do our little movement experience. Instead of us just picking kids arms up to move them for a stretch, they're, they're afforded a little bit of autonomy here that they can decide how they want their wheelchair to be moved instead of us just, just doing it. We also use this to write for a lot of things. So we just play baseball. Oops, sorry. Oh, that's okay. So we just play, no, what did we play? Was it, be, no, bas was it basketball, football, something? It had to have been basketball because it it's March Madness. <laughs> so before, um, and we'll roll a die. And when you roll the die, each thing represents like, it's a, it's a three pointer, it's a this. And if they get it um, before we move them to go to the basket, we'll say, do you want to, be fancy and spin to get to the basket? Do you want to shake? Do you want to tilt back in your wheelchair before we push you to the basket? Or do you want to move back and forth like you're pump faking? Or do you want to bounce or turn side to side? So again, those just, because movement's pretty powerful. Like it's it's like what individuals really like to do is be able to, to move and move their bodies. So instead of us just moving them in a straight way, they have an opportunity to decide how they move. And you consistently keep the order the same. Yes. I'll get into the binders that I make for classrooms. So we wrote our talent show using this. They, they voted on a song that they wanted, their end of the year talent show. And then they got to decide how, what, what dance, what part of, uh, how they wanted their chair to move as their dance. So everybody got a choice. So they would shake. They, someone chose to shake. Someone else chose to shake. Sometimes we say, okay, you want to shake. How many seconds do you want to shake in this song? One, two, three, four. So we'll give them an opportunity to decide number-wise how many times they'd like to shake, how many seconds. And then, um, you know, someone picked back and forth. Someone said spin right. Someone else said spin left. And then we put it all together for the talent show. And what's so fun about this is that they're understanding movement, right? We learn through movement. And this took us... <laughs> took us like an entire month to do our talent show and practice it. And you know what? It was a lot of fun. 
There was a lot of staff engagement and it was really powerful because the kids decided on the music and what they wanted to do for their talent show. So again, instead of doing two and four and us deciding all of this, they were active participants in their end of the year talent show. Another thing we have in our morning meeting, someone's the exercise coach. And it's again, getting our bodies ready to learn. So the, and our students have jobs for a month or two because it just takes a lot of time and repetition to learn something and they get to choose what their job is. So this is the exercise coach. And it's like, okay, do you want to bend and stretch your body, use vibration? Do you want to rub, massage, shake, squeeze, or a tap in your pat on your body to wake up? And so they'll decide how they would like to move their body. And then they will count how many seconds. Okay, do you want to bend and stretch one time, two times, three times? Or do you want vibration for one second, two seconds, three seconds? And they decide how they want to be touched and how they want to be, um, I guess, the sensory. what sensory input they want to help with their arousal level or what their body just might need at that moment. And we level it up even further because I can't tell you how many IEP meetings I sit in when the students are 21 years old and the parent says, I just wish I knew what hurt. And I said, it, when they are three and five years old and we get them, we need to be systematically presenting body parts from day one for the next yeah. 16 years, 17, 18 years of their education. So that at some point after thousands of repetitions, they can tell their caregiver what hurts. They can go to the doctor and tell the doctor what hurts. So we try to keep this consistent. This is the head. This is like your midsection torso. And these are your extremities. So a lot of times we will level up in morning meeting and say, okay, oops, oop, went ahead of myself. All right, you picked bend and stretch. Now you have to pick what body part do you want to bend and stretch? Do you want the top of the body on your head? Do you want the middle of your body? Or do you want an extremity? All right. So you're and not only doing this when they're in pain. You're doing the same, no. the same style Wait, whenever you have the issue, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, you don't learn when you're in pain and you're in a state of crisis, right? right. This is just routine based. Right. Right. So it's so funny. Like a, um, one week with this student picked top of the head and then I was like, okay, head, neck, eyes, nose. And she smiled at me for nose. I said, okay, nose. And she had picked bend and stretch. All right. I was like, all right, everyone. So-and-so picked bend and stretch nose. And like, we were like taking noses and stretch, like bending it side to side and up and down and they were cracking up, but like, it was silly and never something I would have come up on my own, but I don't think any of them ever forgot that that was their nose and someone was bending, stretching it. Right. <laughs> right. It, it's yep. just, it's that error free teaching and learning that I think we lose sight of. I think we spend so much time and I, this was me, this was the old me. I tried so hard to prove to everyone else what these individuals were capable of. I lost sight of the fun and this is fun, right? Just right. you have a good time. Yeah. yeah. Instead of us just putting YouTube music on in the background, listen, there's an hour and a half a day where you're dealing with staff lunches, students that need to um, be fed by a staff member there are times where you just feel like everybody is being passive, but you just don't have the man. It's the it's the reality of a classroom with kids with complex needs. So instead of just putting YouTube on, we might say, do you want rap music? And then we have a DJ for the month. So whoever or two months, the job is their job. They get to pick the, the music for the month that we hear at Rec Leisure Time. So is it rap music, hip hop, classical music? If they vocalize, if they um, move their head to the side for something, we say, I saw you. Um, move your head to the side for classical music. All right. Looks like we're listening to classical music. And you do that over a two month time so that they have enough pack practice and, and get the pattern down rather than yes. changing it every three days or something. Exactly. Like right. switching it every day. It's just, you never get in a rhythm. Mm -hmm. It's like an instrument, right? You yeah. never quite learn it doing it one time a week, but if you get a little bit of practice every day, you get better. Yep. Like motor learning, but you, this is also just learning. Um, if there's options for position equipment, like, okay, they maybe just, and this isn't always an option because equipment shared and it's just not an opportunity. But if there are things available, don't just get stuck on, well, they need to be in the standard at this time. Well, maybe they want to be in the standard for morning meetings so that they stay more alert. And then maybe they're rift and chair later. Um, so instead of us always 
choosing what piece of equipment at what time and, oh, should I get them in the gate train or the standard? Give them the opportunity to make that choice. Yeah, get, right? get, let, them, let them choose the one that's not available because then you get to explain that it's not available and it's still communication. Perfect. Right. Yeah, and that's part of life. Things aren't right. available in life for exactly. all of us. Right. right. Not an option. <laughs> right. So it is better than than taking that option off. Yes. And, and, that, right. It's a teachable exactly. moment. Right. Right. Life isn't always exactly how we plan it to be. Right. It's what you wanted, but guess what? It's unavailable. Emily should get over the fact that she's in scrubs and come over and join us. Oh. Hearing her piping up in the background. <laughs> she she <laughs> She just said a lot more happened today. Uh, I guess this this is when everyone, now that you, if you're 45 and over, you are supposed to get a colonoscopy, okay? Now you know where she was. <laughs> Public service announcement. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, Sorry, she, Emily. it's so easy to just grab a book and say, let's read a book. We should be pausing and say, we have three choices of books that are available. And then you always have your way out. Do you want to read um, Go Dog Go? Pinkalicious, um, Cat in the Hat. Don't just pick the, just don't pick the books for kids. We have audiobook players, which you get free through the Library of Congress. Um, our students, we vote when we're done an audiobook series. So we'll do like Harry Potter, um, Junie B. Jones, what a, oh, Die Every Wimpy Kid, which is the funniest. But all the options, we had our students vote and we were like, majority wins. You may have not wanted um, Junie B. Jones, but Get three other people in your class want a diary of a wimpy kid. And then we'll listen to that audio book for the month. And that's another great resource to have. A, it's free. Families can get it free. Schools get it for free. Um, during that, that really hard time in the day where you're trying to accommodate student lunches and staff lunches. But going back to a book, so you pick a book. And so instead of just passively reading a book, if a student demonstrate something, whether a deep breath or the drop of the head or turn or vocalization, you say, are you trying to tell me something? And you stop on whatever page you're reading and say, did you want to look a little closer at this page? Or you want me to use a flashlight so you can look? Do you want me to turn the page or do you want me to read more of that page? And I will present those items. And if they say, if they take a deep breath or make a vocalization at look, turn and they do their active response, say, oh, you wanted to turn the page. All right, I'll turn it and read the next page. So again, instead of just doing two and four and reading, we're letting them know that when you do something, I'm listening and I'm watching you, you have a way to participate in this shared reading experience because it's not shared reading if you are just reading to an individual. True shared reading is back and forth asking questions. Actually, that would be a great one to add to that. I have a question, right? Right. You might want to say is your question, who, what, where? So there's so much more you could do. See, you, you start talking and then you think of other ways to <laughs> expand it. Pick one of these. Don't get overwhelmed with trying to do all these yeah. things tomorrow. Yeah, pick one thing to try tomorrow. But again, this is something so little that you can do that just really is meaningful and allows for a little more active participation in shared reading. So we will write, one of our lessons in ULS was um, ways we move our body. And we did all these things. We took that, that wheelchair movement thing that I showed you guys earlier, right. Right. and we did all them. And then we let them journal. I like to, and we gave them choices, turn, shake, bounce, none of these. And we let them use their active communication mode and decide how they like to move their body. This way they're journaling and letting other people know, this is what I liked. I'm choosing what I liked. So we'll journal it. And we journal every week and we keep the journal all year. And then we copy it at the end of the year and we send it home with families as like their yearbook. And a way that we elaborated even more, I like to go fast, slow, I don't know. So if they picked a movement, we would say, okay, do you want to try that movement fast or do you want to try it slow? Or I don't know. And if they picked fast and we do it fast. And say, did you like, not like, not so sure of that one. So giving them ability to uh, give an opinion, an original thought of their own. I didn't like it. Or you could say, I saw you grimace when we went fast. Uh, you're telling me you didn't like it. So I'm going to say slow. I like to go slow. Right. And again, these are preferences that you can put in their IEP, likes and dislikes. They don't like to move fast. They like okay. to move slow. Julia, I have a question for you. Do most of your kids have a solid yes and no for confirmation or not? Nope. Okay. 
that would make would life so much easier, right? Yep. I would say most, most do not. Okay. And we'll get into that. That's a whole nother okay. thing. Oh my God. I have nine minutes. No, you don't. Just, just talk. <laughs> You're good. Um, other ways we use lesson picks during literacy. Uh, we were, ULS gives you a framework of like what letters to do each month. So I might errorlessly put on a choice board. Okay. We're learning about the letter N. 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 Do you want to add to our word web? Do you want to add nail? N. Nail. Newspaper. Nurse. And there's no wrong answer here, right? I'm not, right. I'm not throwing in something to throw them off. They have, these students are at a self-contained school because I don't want to say this, but no one else believe in them. They don't need to be tested and challenged any more than they already are. So provide those errorless teaching and learning opportunities. So, um, some, so we would add whatever they showed an active communication response. Oh, I saw you. Um, I saw you extending your seat. I have a lot of students that kind of push up in their seat as their yes. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I saw you, you lift your bottom out of your seat. You want newspaper added to our, our, you know, letter web, or I might give two choices on a choice board, um, or use one of the die that you guys have on lesson picks. We have a die. Have a die. You do, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you see, I don't get super fancy with lesson picks. I kind of keep it simple and just make, and I'm going to get into like what every classroom needs and Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> we do Mad Libs. Every classroom should have a list of adjectives, verbs, and nouns to pull from, right? We like to play Mad Libs. So there might be a pronoun. Okay, let's, I want you to pick a verb and you might pull a couple cards off of the things. You want, do you want a burp, fart, laugh as your verb? None of these. If they pick none of these, I go through three other choices. So there, it's like an errorless way to play Mad Libs. Right. And we just did book reports for Women's History Month. Now, we talked about alternative I We, I'm speaking French. I did not talk about alternative pencils last week. You guys did. And I use a lot of alternative pencils in the classroom, right? Airless. You're Let one of us now. That's how it works. We <laughs> Let everyone scribble. Let students scribble. So for Women's History Month, we were like, all right, let's pick, um, you know, 10 different females we can showcase. So we let our students um, pick what female they wanted to showcase. And then instead of us just saying, okay, let's look up where they were born, where they were born. We'd say, okay, do you want to know who do you, what do you want to do first? Do you want to pick uh, what they did and they're famous for where they lived? You choose. That's another thing. Um, one of the ways out now we add it is you choose like, oh, you want me to choose as your, you know, teacher. Okay. I'll choose. So instead of just deciding like what part of the book report they started with, we gave them a little bit more control and said, okay, do you want to learn about when, why, how, one of these first? And then we had them use their alternative pencil to try to spell the name of Amelia Earhart. I mean, look at what she wrote, M-M-M-L. That yeah. seems like it's a gross approximation of Amelia to me. Yep. But we're presuming potential, we're presuming competence. And- is it Kate Ahern? I think she was the one who said, you know, presuming competence means you put something in front of someone, a communication advice in front of them, they should be competent doing it. No, we all have to be taught and we right. all need thousands of repetitions to learn. You have to presume potential that this individual has the potential to do this. So um, again, exposing kids to the alphabet, using alternative pencils and scribbling. Instead of just choosing the game, oh, this was election day. And I'm like, how can I make election day relevant to any classroom, whether I'm working in preschool or with high schoolers? Because they they don't have the life experience to know the power of an election. <laughs> um, so after we learned about election day, they got to vote. Which game do you want to play? And whatever gets the most is That's what we're gonna do. Want to play. Right. right? That's pretty powerful to understand my vote matters at this teachable moment. So we do have all of these games um, as I think this is blocked on lesson picks because I, I believe it's probably illegal for me to Google image and add stuff to lesson picks. You can add it, but you mm -hmm. can't add it to the sharing center. That's yeah, yep. Yeah. So I was trying to add this and that's why, but we always, instead of deciding on the games, we let the students vote. What games do what game do you want to play this afternoon? Games can play all day, every day for 20 years. 
People play, um, what the hell? Ooh, bunko. bunko. People play Bunko for like 20 years or Pinochle. What, what do mom and dad play uh, in there? Rummy cube. Yeah. So yeah. it's okay. And there's so much math and language that is in games. It doesn't, you're learning. Yeah. You can say, you're well, good. you know what? We're working yeah. on numbers and colors here. If you're concerned about why are we just playing games? I like your predictable chart writing too. Yes. That chart right there. Oh, yeah. Right predictable. The I vote for. Right. Yep. Karen okay. Erickson be very proud of you. <laughs> yep. So this was, um, we were designing shoes. They were designing shoes from five below. So these are $5 sneakers and we were making them for someone in the building, having a baby and then auctioning them off for a fundraiser. Cool. So they got to pick what color they wanted their shoe design. And then they got to pick all the different types of patterns that they wanted to add to their shoes. Very nice. way, yeah, it was so fun. The way we broke it down is like, okay, this is a design for the front of the shoe. This is for one side, back of the shoe, other side. So it was really, it took like a, five days to complete this test, but it's the process, not the product, right? Right, right. We don't want to just do these things. We want them to be active participants and active participation takes time with our students. It's not just like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> this week, we, it's a Philly Fanatic's birthday here in Philly. And so we read a book about the Philly Fanatic and we talked about a mascot is a representation of an organization. And we talked about how mascots are non-speaking, but they're very expressive without saying a word. Oh, so good. we try to relate it to them. Like they right. might not say anything, but they're expressive humans. You know, when they're mad out there, you know, when they're putting a whammy on the other team, you know, when they're excited and happy. So we um, taught in the Philly obviously has the most famous mascot in the world is the Philly Fanatics. So we designed our own mascots Tuesday. So they got to pick the shape of the body of their mascot. And if you if you have a student that just really likes the way that a die sounds when it's rolled, we we will add one, two, three, four, five, six. If they roll die and land on six, oh, your six landed on the star. So we can adapt it that way. Yeah. If someone isn't really engaged in the activity, we might add a die to it. And that's their form of participation. If they're going to push that die off their tray or press that switch to make the die go, they might not be participating the same way as other individuals, but they are participating in their way. And that's the other thing about active participation. It is different for every single person and very subjective. So it's not going to look the same for every student. You got to know your kids, right? Right. So then they got to pick what pattern they wanted the body of the mascot to be. Then they got to pick, okay, the, here, I have it all here. What shape eyes do you want? Then the next one was like, what shape nose do you want? What shape mouth do you want? Okay. And then these were the arms. Do you want striped arms, zigzag, wavy, spiral? Do you want, um, and then the next one will be legs and hair. And then we even leveled up even more. And it took all day yesterday, Tuesday. Yesterday was Tuesday. It took us all day day to do this activity with five students because we had students out. So what did they come up with? Here are their mascots. Awesome. Right? Very cool. amazing. So they came up with these mascots and then they used their alternative pencils to name their mascots. So we had one with six. Oh, that was the other thing. They got to choose how many pieces of hair how many arms, how many legs. And even if it was hitting a step-by-step -step, one, two, and they stopped on two, oh, you stopped on two, you want two legs. Or if they took a deep breath when you got to number five, I saw you take that deep breath, I heard it. You want five arms on your mascot, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And we also decorated nutcrackers the same exact way. We used those patterns and they got I mean, to design the nutcracker starting at the 3D. head. Look at that, in 3D. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, they designed it. Um, they're sloppy copy. And then they then and again, are we doing the actual drawing? Yes. But this is in hand over hand. They are controlling the way it's going to be done. Right. It's their intent. Yes. Right. Um, ULS had the Toyota car challenge where students and typical kids had to decide or they got to design a car. So we use that same. Um, you know, shapes, colors, patterns, and they got to design a car. And we mailed them in to Toyota. And then we used our alternative uh, pencils to name what their car model was. So it was a Toyota Befka. Yeah. Right? Right. 
I mean, that looks like a fun car to ride in. It's not practical. Right. I mean, it's like practical. Cool name. right? But again, we use those kind of partner assisted scanning. This student also had an eye gaze system that she used. So it doesn't just have to be partners. You can use your communication devices at the same time. But a lot of these things could be fringe that might not be on their communication device. Yeah, zigzag is like not me. even close. Let me skip through this. Okay. So yes, hey, no. Like I'm skipping through things because this this is what happens to me. I get excited and passionate. Use this eye gaze frame to teach yes and no. Right. You know, can't um Karen, Karen Kangas, I would, I watched her and she was like, someone told me that we should have eye gaze frames with the yes at the top and the bottom and the no and left and right. I'm like, duh, what are you doing here? You're teaching gestures and gestures. Yeah, look are, at that. Yeah, look at that. Yep. So gestures are universal design. Right. It doesn't take an in, in tune communication partner to know that up and down means yes and side to side means no. Yeah, look at that. Yep. So we you have think, to you put that in the sharing center. It's in the sharing center. Ugh. Very cool. Right? Um, I have a student right now that we're just writing her at our IEP, and she leans forward for, she has rets, so she leans forward for yes and turns one way for no. So we're going to use these picture icons. This will be on her tray, and we mm -hmm. might hold this side, this one up on her left side so she's really getting that visual feedback of when I lean forward towards the yes, I'm right. just, yes, when I turn my head one side, it means no. And Linda Burke had said, we have to do better about teaching articulate yes and no. Even if it takes 18 years to teach it, it's right. the most universal and kids can be taught. Right. Now we know our, some of our students are, are, um, are kind of stuck in certain positions, but if you can teach, you know, maybe the chin down a little bit is a yes and a turn, a turn to the, the left is no, that's right. universal. Everyone understands that. So yes, this is a yes, no eye gaze that we use to teach the gesture of yes and no, because a lot of our students don't have a yes and no. Right. But it makes an enormous difference. For, I mean, if you can get a yes and no, a solid yes and no, at the very least, you can confirm the partner assisted scanning and know that you were right when you saw that gesture. Exactly. Right. I mean, yes, no is pretty powerful. And on that communication matrix, it's a little high up there, but right. Linda calls it accept rejects. So when yes is accept, because no offense, my speech therapist friends get caught on and I can say, because my twin's a speech therapist. Well, yes is a higher level skill. Yes and no are higher level there. You know, we can't work on yes and no because it's too high, but really yes and no is accept and reject and accept and rejects way low on that communication matrix. Right. So just right. call it accept, reject instead of yes and no. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to turn. Oh, and then we obviously print things off of lesson picks or we take the PDF and send it to Staples to be printed on corrugated plastic so that we have big boards, big communication boards, big game boards, all types of things. All right. Cool. That, OK, how I'm do good. I uh, am I going to get the hook? Are you giving no, it? You're good. Doug, as long as you want. We don't care. Okay. <laughs> all right. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. All right. I am going to switch cameras. And show you what every classroom needs if you're working using lesson picks. Start with one or two. I will start with I laid it out. No, I meant that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, oh, her mouth just goes like this. There you uh, okay. Go. What am I doing? Settings. You're supposed to, right? Settings. I got it. Settings. Okay, I got it. Woohoo. I don't believe you. Here we go. Yay. Yay. So let me just show you, I have that eye gaze frame that we use for that gestural teaching of yes and no. Right. Um, so back when we were teaching the, we were doing the book reports, we might just ask a student, do you want to do, what do you want to, maybe not that one. They picked two. So they may have picked Tina Turner, Dolly Parton, Maya, we've decided who they're going to pick. So the next thing is, all right, let's write our book report about this. We've got to do a little research. Um, do you want to know what they did, where they were from, when they were born, or you have your way out, which is... Where did I put it? I'll find it. I have this no way out. Nice. <laughs> so, so pretend that these are ways out. Here's the partner assisted scanning. You might say you choose. Right. 
So, okay, do you want to learn what they go. did, where they were from, when you choose? And I do that partner assisted scanning. Instead of us just deciding the order of events and research, every kid, there might be the person who wants to learn where they were from first. Right. Let them decide. And sure, you doing the research on the iPad for them, yes, but they told you what to do. And having asserting control over other people is really powerful because they depend on people for everything. Right. So that's kind of, we have this. Is, let me just go back to this is how, this is what I have. I have an enormous binder. Okay. Three ring binder. And I have all of the stuff that we use weekly, daily in this binder. Wow. Just this out. Okay. Now it looks a little crazy because I, every week I have a new idea and an, so what I do is that I always make a base, a home base, because if I didn't have a home base for the pictures, I would never put anything back where it belonged right. and would never be able to find anything I ever needed. Yep. And then what I do, I get at the dollar store, these um, like removable, writable um, index, index tabs, tabs yep. so that I tab the bottom so I know it's easier to find. So we do mute the music choices, which we talked about. Here's the body part pages where, okay, top of body, middle of body, bottom of or extremities. And someone's like, you can't put a butt on there. I said, yes, I can. It's probably what hurts most with everyone. We have one. Everybody's <laughs> got one. Yes. And that's probably what hurt. We were sitting in a wheelchair all day. Um, <laughs> then here's the sensations where they get to pick, well, you know, what body part and then what sensation would you like? The wheelchair movements. Then I do have this in there as well, um, you know, up, down, left, right of how they want to move their wheelchair, slow, fast. You can tell me when to go or stop. These are all the choices for partner assisted scanning. These are the ways out. Something different. None of these. I don't know. Phone a friend. We added that to be able to ask a peer for help. Like how okay. fun is that? It's a good idea. Yep. Yeah. Um, you choose, you know what? I'll pass hard pass. Not, not doing it. We play a ton of games. So I do have the lesson pick dice on here. Um, numbers. You always have to have numbers accessible because I feel like it's involved in everything. Here's that story helper where right. we talk about when we're doing shared reading. Do you want to look at the um, page a little closer? You want me to read more of it or should I turn the page? So if you're reading a story, you can just say, oh, story helper, pull that one out. A book review. You, did you like it? Was it okay? Or you did not like it? Do you, do, you use the, do you use these from the book or do you have a felt pad that you put them onto? Oh, funny you ask. <laughs> I hate Velcro. I use binder clips for everything. Okay. This is a chalkboard from the dollar store because it's just easier. It's not as much prep to put Velcro on things and you can be a little bit more, more spontaneous. You can switch things around. I just like in the, all the years, I feel like binder clips are just the easiest thing to use for pictures. Yep. Yeah, all right. Cool. This is when they were doing Mad Libs. Um, <clears throat> these are alternative pencils. Do you want to use a marker for me to write? Do you want me to use a crayon to write? Colored pencils. We can use watercolors to write. We can use this, the alphabet stamps to write a pen, or we can type it on the computer. So instead of me just doing it and deciding how it's going to be written, they can choose what writing tool that I use to do the writing. Here are some of the alternative pencils. This is a someone who is a scanner, okay? High frequency letters are in this top corner because they're the fastest to get to for scanners. So this is someone, row one, E-A-R-D-U-V, Nope, none of those. Row two, T-O-I-L-G-K. They give you an active response. Oh, I saw you move your head for that row. Do you want teat? Oh, ah, I, I, L. They do something. Oh, you said L. You want me to write the letter L. So this is a scanning alphabet for your um, one and two switch scanners. Then we and just you, have a regular. And you oh, them use that consistently. So you don't, do you switch between those on the kids or do you always stick to one? If I have scanners, um, they are using this one because okay. they're mostly going to have a device that matches that. Right. But I have this one for my app, for my students who are using communication like modes. I use this one. 
right. who I've have CBI, right. I might say yep. A, B, or C. And the way this works, if they say, they show me something and they say, I say A, B, or C, they pick their head up. I'm like, oh, you want A, B, or C? Then I go through individually. Do you want A? Wow. Yeah. B, C. And if they vocalize at C, oh, I heard your voice at C. You want C? And I'll write a C. So this is for someone who might have a cortical visual impairment. Right. Did that um, come from the UNC site? No, this That's is one I made. Okay. Man, um, looks great. Just to, it's, it's scanned in. If you want, if people can buy our adapted game pack if they're watching. Then, um, so here's, this is all the voices that they can pick to be programmed in their device. All the position equipment is in here. Right. So everything that you're, you're going to see throughout their day is, is yeah. in there. Plus things they might talk about, right? Yup. Adjectives, sure. nouns, verbs all those patterns because art can be very passive, right? We find people do hand over hand. That's okay. They're doing this art project. How can they have some say in how it's done? So that's right. what your patterns and shapes are for. We do have adapted ways of doing yeah, we do have adapted ways of doing art, but that's a whole nother presentation. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's Debbie Schwinn's thing and Judy yeah. Schoonover's thing, right? The art kit. Yeah. Yeah. Games. These are the games they get to choose from. I don't really do weather. So this is the way that we organize. All this is on lesson the last one. There, We use the alternate spinners in the classrooms a lot of times, just because if you add a die or spinner to anything, um, becomes a game. This goes on that alternate spinner that AbleNet sells. Right. And again, I just binder clip pictures to it. That's right. a good solution because people want that as a template and we have not been able to make that. Do so you understand why? So it's you, too big. What, it's right. Too big. So in every direction. So like, it's yes. just 12 inches across, so it won't even fit on 11 by 17. It's just, yep. it's so just, just brutal. Cut your own and then add your own pictures to it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the other the other neat thing is we, we have other spinners now, right? So you have the play tools and you have it on your phone now. And oh, awesome. Have yeah, you not everybody. seen those? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, All right. Well, we'll, we'll show, show that, that in a second. Yeah, I get kind of stuck in just using pictures. I need to be better. But I do... I do use your game boards and I add kids IEP goals to it. Like choose a letter, choose a friend, choose a teacher. Um, so I do use like add little IEP goals to make it fun. Cause again, if you add a spinner and dice to anything, right. all of a sudden, right. what does Mary Poppins say? And every job that can be done, there's an element of fun. You find the fun and snap the jobs a game. That's you got to think of it that way with our kids and our students. <laughs> So, um, so I would tell people that the picture cards are at the top for a reason because it's what I use the most. Yes. Like, you know, and the most versatile template. I made a calculator. <laughs> Look at that. I, I like low you tech. You do that with hiding cells on you. Yes. Your... And it's where yes. they're learning where things are. And if they just touch a five, so this is someone who might direct select, or I might be modeling if they, you know, five. Oh, you want a five? And then plus, they touch four, four, okay, equals nine. So it's just a fun little way to add a, um, a calculator sure. without it being like a device. Right. I also use your QWERTY keyboard to make laptops for students. So it's just <laughs> a manila folder, your QWERTY keyboard. And I, if I'm like, okay, so because my daughter one year was like, I want a laptop for Christmas. She was like three. I was like, I'll make you a laptop. This way. There you go. It fits right on your laptop. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I might be like, oh, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write the word sun, S-U-N. And then they practice S, you know, right. typing it out. Right. Very cute. It's a fun little way to use your lesson picks keyboards. But we are big into games in this house, big into games and at school. So one of the new schemes I just found out is called Shut the Box. And I'm gonna throw um, throw our business out there for a second. We have adapted game pack on our website where we have adapted probably 20 different games for students with all different access needs. And it's like, you don't have to think at all about it. So it tells you the materials you need, how you play with the direct selector, how you play with someone who uses eye gaze, how you play with someone who has one switch scanner or partner assisted scanner, how you play with someone who uses two switch, how you play with someone who just has an active communication response at this point. Right. And then you have core vocabulary targets. So this was off a lesson. Pick. I made it off a lesson picks. 
And the way the game shut the box works is you have not letter or numbers one through nine. Can you guys see that? Oh, can, yeah. yeah. Oh, and I like minor clips for this reason, too, because kids like to flick things and pull things and... It'd be a great schedule this way. If you put schedules on a binder clip, you're done that one. You're done this one. Yeah. It's just a fun little way. So the way you play Shut the Box, okay. the lesson picks cards, they roll two die, and they get a three and a one. So I'll present to my students. I might take a lesson picks card, or I might take two dry erase markers and say, oh, wait, you got a three plus one equals four. What they have to figure out, what numbers can I flip down and use that sums of four? So I might give someone the, uh, the option of saying, okay, you, you can do three plus one. So you can use your three and your one, or you can shut down the four. And I might hold these two up to them and I'll say, you know, um, I gaze to which one you want to do. Do you want four or do you want to do three plus one equals four? If they look at three plus one, then I knock down the three and the one, and then you can't use those numbers again. So it is an errorless way to work on math, right? You roll the die again. Okay, you got a two. The only option with this, and I'll show them, oh, the only option is to flip down the number two. So I'm gonna flip the two down. There's no other way that we can make a sum of two. Right. And you just play that way. And we've been playing this game for two weeks now in the classroom, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, oh, one more, and then I'm done, I promise. <laughs> this is something that I use, um, but I don't use your dice roller format. Again, I just use your picture cards. Right. You probably cut this into strips, but you could use a cup pourer or the dice roller that you can get. Um, but they roll, and you have to roll until you get that number. And look at that. I actually got it first try. So the way we play this in the classroom is you get three rolls to try to get the number. If you don't get that number in three rolls, it's the next person's turn. So I have to try to roll this. That's a two. That's a two. That's a three. Up, oh, it's someone else's turn. It's a simple errorless way to work on switch access if they're working on um, using a switch. You can put this dice on their foot. And if they lift their foot up, it rolls the die and say, oh, you rolled a two. They need to know that... If I move my foot, someone's going to, that means something. I have control over something. So put the dice there. Right. They can move their foot. Use what they can do. So they might use their foot and they just go through that linear. And again, you're teaching number identification. And counting. Um, right. Counting. Right. All different things. So that's also in your sharing center too. It's just a fun little errorless game that doesn't you know, doesn't make anyone have to really think about um Am I right or wrong here? Right. Roll three times. It's someone else's turn. And we do a lot of who, what teacher do you want to help you with this activity? Or what teacher do you want to change your, your, um, to help you freshen up in the bathroom? And we'll dump all the staff's pictures in the lesson picks. And because they should have the right to, to pick who's going to be freshening them up in the bathroom. Maybe they don't like the way someone turns them on the changing table. Right. We'll be like, do you want Emily? Julie, Brendan, or Mike, and show them the pictures. And if they show you an active response, you say, oh, you picked Emily. All right, Emily, it's your turn. And people will be like, well, you know, it's not fair that this person, you got to honor these people's wishes. Right, right. Needs, when you're done two and four all day and you spend your entire life waiting, we need to pause in these little, um, little daily routines and say, how can we afford a little more control for this individual? Yep. Yep. Cool. Power moments. Flip your camera back. I want to see you. Say hi. <laughs> how do I do that? My hair's pulled back. Hold on. No, nope, I turn it off. I'll get there. Sweating. You're already you're already done with us, huh? There the you go. Look at that. She's, Look at that. She's in her pajamas. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. <laughs> I know. We. I bet we lost a lot of people. I went on a um. It's okay. Hour, Don't worry. We we got great clips to add. We're gonna put up some great clips of you. So, <laughs> so I want like to drink something. from a fire hose. You covered a lot. You did. You covered a an lot absolute of ton. Stuff. So there's a wealth of information. But, and I, don't be surprised when you look later because the views go way up. A lot of people can't do it at this exact time. Right, especially the West Coast. Right, it's early. Yeah. So if I want to show you some stuff from something, and you can take it back tomorrow exactly. in your classroom 
Yes. It's winter. Go. <laughs> All right. So I found some of your stuff online. I went to the sharing center. I went to the Julie Marzano, the, the uh, FMBC uh, user, right? Yep. But there's something, a couple things that, that I want to mention. First, some people are like, those don't look like lesson pick symbols. They're not. Some they're, of them are. They're the Unity symbols first because you've them. turned them on and they must you must use PRC devices in the classroom and match them. Or you just turn them on by default. My old school, we were big PRC. Here we're more mm -hmm. Do Toby Dynavox. Mm -hmm. But again, most of the students I have in my one classroom are at an active communication response and they right. don't have a device but my hopes is always something that will translate to a device right gotcha. fair enough that's very nice so, so vibrate and squeeze are lesson picks pictures and uh the other four are prc well throughout throughout there's been a mix mm -hmm. and i like the fact that you're able to pull sometimes from there's do the photos searches. and we right. have all kinds of yeah representations yep. there I love and so it. they're all in there and then you'll see these say unity on them to show which ones are which um the, the other thing I wanted to show you, because it sounds like you don't know this, is that we have tools now after COVID that if you put your pictures in your tray like this and mm -hmm. you go up, we have these play tools. Oh. And so you can literally say, I need a spinner with the pictures in my tray and check it out. <laughs> This works amazing on an iPad it works or your phone. Perfectly on your phone, Wait, too. Emily just said, I knew that. You didn't know that. <laughs> so so we can do that. You also can do this inside of PowerPoint and Google Slides, uh -huh. uh, right on the side of the, your game and things like that. Um, so I know you're a big PowerPoint user. I saw you with, uh, with PowerPoint custom stuff there. A lot of people don't use PowerPoint anymore. Yeah. It's like Google yeah. Slides. No, they, they work the same. I, and I, they don't, don't um, hate me for saying this. It's okay. I feel like we've had a tough time transitioning back to hands-on learning after COVID because we got oh. very comfortable putting everything on PowerPoints and yeah. on the smart board that right. I love lesson picks because I can take those pictures up and present it rather than it being, I feel like the smart boards feel more of a spectator than an active participator. Okay. So I love that I can take pictures up and people are like, how do you know they can see them? I'm like, I'm giving verbal and auditory right. cues too. And mm -hmm. if they pick squeeze and they don't, I'm respectfully presuming potential incompetence. If they can see it or if they hear it, I'm giving that multi-total approach to communication. And if they respond to that, I respond by what doing what they ask me to do. So we Very hope cool. it connects. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is awesome. I like everything you're showing. Um, and actually, it, it is very rare that we see somebody from this part of the trenches, right? I mean, it's interesting. We were talking to a, a, a special ed teacher today from mm -hmm. a center school, probably a similar population to yours, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, here in here in Pinellas County, and they're setting up something awesome. You wait, wait till you see it. So it's an AT Makers project too. Oh, uh, they have they have built they had a parent, awesome parent uh, named Michelle, whatever her last name is, um, came in and said we need to make a gaming lounge for the special need for the the low incidence kids. Yeah, right? and, and she was getting lots of, but they can't do that. I'm like sure they can, right? So she got this grant, she got grants, and she got funds, and she she made this whole room. And then AT Makers got her the AT X Xbox adaptive controller, oh, yeah. and the switches, and we're making things for each of the kids. And they're gonna they're gonna be using this because with the Copilot, they have to be able to hit one switch. And you know what? Participating in an Xbox game is gonna be more motivating than anything else you can get these kids to do to hit that switch. Okay. Exactly. And you can place it over there on their left side and cross the midline or whatever else mm -hmm. that you guys want to do. OTs always want to cross the midline. But um, I, I don't look at that. Don't? As mm -mm. So, well, I, it, it, use their God given gifts. Things are hard enough for them already. I'm going to do what they have. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then with your audience, with your, uh, with your population, you're not wrong, right? <laughs> so what was Emily saying? She's just ranting in the background. Yeah, that's when you're following the developmentally normal. Yes. Gotcha. Child. Yes. Fair enough. Put her name back in there. Kids don't follow we need to adapt to the students' abilities, and that's hard for a lot of us to do. One of the questions I know we're going to get is, you must have a, you must be one on one with these kids a lot. You must have a very small group that you're working with, correct? Well, I work two days a week. Um, 
one, I have nine students in one room. We now have six in another for various reasons. Um, and I just block my time in a, one classroom a day. Okay. And then as, a part, as, as someone who really values participation, I don't know where participation breakdowns are unless I'm working in a classroom and right. I see the student in their natural environment and their natural learning environment or see where the, the, the teacher might be struggling um, on how to increase participation. So I'm in do a room. You, do, you model, do you model for the teacher and, and drive them to do this so that the, the other four days of the week um, this is followed through? Is that yes. the goal here? Yep. And yes. That's what I do. Not everyone's that way, but I found that like it, when you model and people see it's the kids showing them what they can do. I show yeah. them how to present the materials and the kids respond and the, the staff sees it and they just go with it. Right. And one of the great ways to start with this is with a game. So one of my teachers is new and we'll start with a adapt a game every Tuesday afternoon. It's shut the box and they've played that every afternoon for the last two weeks. Right. Right. Very cool. Right. It's okay. And, and you're, are you still using the, uh, the the dice rollers that we? Yes. Have? I wish I took a picture or video. Yes, we are using the dice. We give the kids a choice. Do you want to pick what number you want? Do you want to roll the number, uh, or do you want to? We also have a big die that will like I can put it on your head, and they'll drop their head and it'll roll across. So we let them. <laughs> how how would you like to roll? <laughs> so, so Julie, I, I've got a great story about that dice roller. She knows this. Um, so AT Makers, the charity that I, I run, yes. they, Julie asked us for a dice roller that they could switch adapt and, and have the dice roll. And so I, all the, she, she asked the question on the group and I kind of, you know, read it, but I wasn't the one who was going to answer this one because Brady Fulton and, and a whole bunch of people like started talking about the best way to do a dice roller, like a cup that poured and, and all these different answers, which was great. And they had all these debates about which one, and you could see them all making them all. And like two weeks later, I got up and I'm like, did anybody send one to Julie? Like you all made one and bragged about how great they were, but did Julie ever get one? Eventually you did. Eventually yeah. you got well, one. But is I thought it, it was a very engineer thing to do. To, to solve it and not actually provide it to the request. <laughs> there were two. One was 3D printed from Ada. Yes. Is it Adafruit? Adafruit? Adafruit. Yep. Adafruit so sent Adafruit. me one. And then someone in AT Maker. I think whoever was. Everybody. So, they both it. were from AT. Yeah. So, so Noah Ruiz from Adafruit sent you one. And I think Brady Fulton sent you the other one. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Nice. So I'm glad they're still working. That's awesome. Yeah. So. So oh, cool. Great. And when they break, let us know. We'll get you new ones. <laughs> you know, the other thing, like there are students that just love the sound that it makes when it rolls. And guess what? That's their means of participation. Are right. they, do they know if they landed mm -hmm. on a two and they, they shut the number two down? I don't know. I'm going to presume that they do understand, but that point they liked the way it sounded and it brought them joy and right. that's participation. Yeah. All right. Oh, that's great. All right. Great I think line there. I think it's my roommates just for, came home. Yeah, I, I was gonna say it's probably a good line to end on since we're like half an hour over. Somebody <laughs> likes to talk. I know. I like I to it. talk too. So, but uh, did we're, you? Know, we're passionate. We're passionate oh, about right. this. Is a very underserved population. Yeah. And they have a lot of ability. It's just figuring out right how where it is to access that. Right. Yeah. Yep. Well, thanks right. for having me. Happy OT month. Plenty. Happy OT month. Happy OT month. And thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, do, oh, do and the adaptive anything, games. Anything here. I'm going to pitch real quick. Yes. Finemotorbootcamp.net. We sell an adaptive game bundle with all of these adaptive the games. Yeah. Gotcha. So I it's love a that. great way to start in a classroom. Pick one game, model it play it, do it. There's all the guesswork's gone on access method. Excellent. It's all there. Cool. So and all the visuals are in lesson picks. Yeah. We'll have to put a link in the comments. Yeah. There you go. All, all right. right guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Lori. Right. Good, Good to see you guys. Yeah, Bye, Emily. I'm sorry that we saw you for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry about right. today. I hope tomorrow's better. Oh, no, it's not. It's all I'm better not. now. All right. All right. All right. It's all it's all behind her, no pun intended. All, behind all right. Now. On that note, I'm out of here. Right. Thank you for thank you. She's, she's gone. She is out. Poof. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, post them either in Facebook or YouTube, and we will watch them and answer them afterwards.
Yeah. And we will be back next week for Judy Schoonover. Yay. Yay. Who well, we I will, a- I'm going to crack a whip on Judy. She gets an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, well, Julie. Julie. I'm picking on you for sharing, sharing so much. And uh, you can't expect to see some little clips of, of that. Oh, my gosh. There's no there doubt. There's a, a ton in there to, to drop. A ton on. of information. So, so. All right, everybody. It. Thank you. And we'll talk to you all later.